so much, Louise. And now I would like to present our keynote dialogue speakers, Dr. Mary Schmidt Campbell and Dr. Andrea Barnwell Brownlee. It is both an honor to be able to introduce these two amazing women and also deeply meaningful to me on a personal level. I was first introduced to Mary's scholarship as a student of David Driscoll's at the University of Maryland and have long been in awe of her academic and civic achievements. And Andrea and I met literally decades ago while I was working at the National Museum of African Art and she was a very strong and constant presence in the building uh, in her time in DC as well. And I have followed her curatorial then directorial career in admiration. Thank you both for being here today and for the work that you do to champion and advance the arts and those in the arts by being exceptional leaders as well as intellectual and ethical models and especially for your dedication to the next generation. Dr. Mary Schmidt Campbell is the 10th president of Spelman College, a leading women's college dedicated to the education and global leadership of black women. Before coming to Atlanta in 2015, she was a major force in the cultural life of New York City for nearly four decades. Mary's career began in 1977 at the Studio Museum in Harlem, where she transformed the institution from a rented loft to a, the country's first accredited museum dedicated to the work of artists of African descent. In 1987, she was named Cultural Affairs Commissioner for New York City gaining a reputation as a tireless advocate for arts organizations, large and small, in all five boroughs. Mary returned to the private sector to become dean of the New York University's Tisch School of Arts in the fall of 1991, nurturing the institution into one of the finest art schools in the country, known for producing artistic trailblazers in theater, film, and interactive media. In September of 2009, former President Barack Obama appointed Mary Vice Chair of the President's Commission of the, on Arts and Humanities, a nonpartisan advisory committee to the President of the United States on cultural matters. As Vice Chair, she took an active role in reaffirming the arts as one of the ingredients essential to effective public school education. Mary holds a Bachelor of Arts degree in English Literature from Swarthmore College, where she also served for 12 years on its Board of Managers. She received a Master's degree in Art History from Syracuse University and a Doctorate of Humanities degree also from Syracuse. She is a Fellow of the Acad American Academy of Arts and Sciences and serves on the board of several institutions, including the Alfred B. Sloan Foundation, the Doris Duke Charitable Foundation, and the Hyde Museum of Art. Mary is a much respected scholar on a range of topics, especially well known for her publications on the art of the Harlem Renaissance. Most recently, very recently, she published An American Odyssey, a definitive biography of the artist Romary Bearden, who was in fact her mentor and the one who first encouraged her to apply for the position at the Studio Museum. I love that story. Dr. Andrea Barnwell Brownlee is an art historian, curator, writer, and the director of Spelman College Museum of Fine Art, which is the only museum in the nation focused on art by and about women of the African diaspora. At Spelman, she has curated and co-curated several exhibitions, including Hal, Hal Woodruff, Nancy Elizabeth Prophet and the Academy, Undercover, Performing and Transforming Black Female Identities, Africa Forecast, for, for Fashioning Contemporary Life, and Deborah Roberts, The Evolution of Mimi, all of which have garnered widespread acclaim. In 2012, she also organized with Valerie Cassell Oliver, Cinema Remixed and Reloaded, Black Women Artists in the Moving Image Since 1970, the first exhibition organized by American curators to be presented at the Havana Biennial. Andrea is also the author of a monograph on Charles White, part of the David C. Driscoll series of African American art, as well as several uh, exhibition catalogs. She is also an alumna of Spelman College and earned her PhD in art history from Duke University in 2001. She is widely recognized for her leadership in several arenas, including curating exhibitions that excavate the contributions of black women artists, advocating for artists through public art initiatives, 
in preparing the next generation of curators and museum professionals. This includes the launching in 2016 of a two-year curatorial studies program to increase diversity in the museum industry funded by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. Andrea has received several academic, professional, and scholarly awards, including the 2013 David C. Driscoll Prize in African American Art and Art History from the High Museum of Art, and the 2015 James A. Porter Award from Howard University. Please welcome Andrea and Mary. It's really our great pleasure to be here with you all today. You know, when we first started talking about this conversation, we started saying how we wanted to really, really hone in on how we got into this field. And we wanted to hear more from you all about the next generation of museum professionals. But that was about eight months ago. Right. And so many things have happened in the last eight months that our initial plans have changed. So I think what we're going to do is for about 45 minutes, we are going to just have a conversation and then we'd love to field questions from you all if that's okay. okay. So I was really, really compelled by um, Louise's introduction and when she shared the two exhibitions that are currently on view in this museum right now, it's slightly different <laughs> from when you were thinking about becoming an art historian and becoming a curator. And I'd love it if you would talk about the in your introduction to the field and how it's changed. No, I, I marveled at, at hearing the story that there's Augusta Savage and Betty Saar here. Um, when I was an undergraduate, if you had asked me what, what is art history, I couldn't have told you. I took one of those survey classes that you know, you're required to take if you're at a liberal arts college. And I, one day I saw something posted about a special seminar. Somebody was coming from London and was gonna teach a seminar on modern European painting and modern American art. I thought, oh, well, this might be fun. I'll sign up for this. The, the faculty member who taught it was a man by the name of David Sylvester. He died a long time ago, but he was an incredible curator. He was personal assistant to Giacometti, Henry Moore. He had, he had just, he was at the Tate Gallery. He just had an incredible history and involvement uh, in contemporary, especially in contemporary art. And he hated slides. He thought slides are lies. <laughs> so he made us go to all the local museums. So we had to go to the Barnes Foundation, we had to go to the Museum of Modern Art, the Philadelphia Museum, we had to go to Baltimore, I see the Cohn Collection. And that was my introduction to art history in the physical space of the object. So I fell in love, totally in love with art history. Fast forward to when I'm in graduate school. And I've been asked by my professor to do a lecture on some aspect of American art history that's not in the, the conventional narratives. So I choose African-American artists, and I chose Jacob Lawrence. And she said, yeah, but there's this other artist named Romley Bearden, and she showed me the catalog of his retrospective. So I opened it, and I saw work that I had, representations of black life I had never seen before. So my husband and I traveled to New York. It's a, by this time, the show has traveled around the country, and it's a studio museum. We see the work, I'm blown away. We spend the rest of the day going to every single museum that showed either American art or contemporary art to try to find another piece of his work. <coughs> not only could we not find any of his work, we couldn't find the work of African American artists. And that was in, I would say, the early 1970s, right? And so to come to this point and to come to the New York Historical Society and find not one but two, really speaks volumes to how much the whole field has evolved over the past 40 years. 
I marvel at your involvement in the Student Museum in Harlem. And you mentioned that it was a, a loft space, a rented loft space. Again, how things Over a liquor store and a Kentucky Fried <laughs> Chicken. Yes, we can say it. It's okay. I forgot to add that footnote. But um, I, I, again, I am completely um, taken aback, truly, truly taken aback by the things that have changed. There's still a, a long way to go, but the things that have changed in, in the field. So one of the things that um, Krista asked me to do is to share a bit about how I entered the field and like many of you all, my parents at first said, come again? <laughs> <laughs> so, but at the same time, you know, very, very fortunate to have parents that said, look, if you can figure out how to convert this into a paycheck, go for it, go for it. So as Krista mentioned, I am indeed an alumna of Spelman College and taking art history courses and just becoming completely smitten by the field like many of you all did and continue, continue to be. But there's so much work to be done. I know that we were talking about the Mellon Foundation earlier in your remarks and so many of us in this, in this very room owe the Mellon Foundation an extraordinary debt of gratitude. However, what they have enabled and compelled us to do at Spelman College, we thought we'd park on that for a few minutes. A lot of people have asked us, what are y'all doing? What are y'all building down there? And so it's something that we're very, very proud of and something that maybe we should park on for a while. So, so Andre is being very modest um, because uh, one of the things that has changed is the uh, opportunity for us to not only look at the art that has traditionally not been in museums, but also to look at museums themselves. Look at them as structures, um, as the content, as the, you know, the idea of a museum. And Andrea has been one of those pioneers that has, that has really taken up that conversation. So it was in 2014 um, that Mellon actually awarded our, our, our grant for curatorial studies. So talk a little bit about what compelled you to decide that it was time to start a curatorial studies program at a black women's college in Atlanta. So Ann Collins Smith and I work closely together on a regular basis. And I got really fired up one day. People were starting to use the word curate in ways that really <laughs> were getting under my skin. And I was talking about, we need to stop curate abuse. We're using the word <laughs> wrong and I, you know. And some of our students were indeed using that term. It had just started to become the thing. And so we always talked about the importance of mentoring, but we also knew that it was really time to formalize this thing. So, of course, in 2014, Mellon came to visit us. Mellon has been a longtime champion of Spelman College. And they came, and we had a conversation about what's next and some of the things that they were funding. And they asked if we could have a conversation. We had spent some time together at um, one of the AAMD conferences, and they asked if they could come by and see the museum. And we're closed during the summer. And I said, but we're not dressed. <laughs> they said, we just want to see, you know, what are you, you know, what are you all building here? What are you building here? And so they came and I said, although nothing is on view, this is the vision. We have incredible students that are very interested in diving deeper and becoming museum professionals. At that particular moment, um, we were preparing for another show and I, nothing was on the wall. So I was being very, 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 very self-conscious about inviting people over and nothing was on the walls. But they sort of heard our cry. They really, really thought, wait a minute, maybe they're onto something. If there's this art history program that is in the midst of change, there is a group of museum professionals that sees that there is a great dearth of African Americans in the field, they agree that this is indeed the place to kick this off. So as much as I love 
Thelma Golden, Janetta Cole, Frank Lee Sermons, um, Belinda Tate. We are the only ones that are African Americans that are in the room at AAMD on a regular basis. And we're over it. We needed to take some very, very bold moves to make bold changes. So we put together a proposal. They invited us to submit a proposal. And that proposal was really based on four things. And those four things are certainly academic coursework being the principal thing. Mentoring, no surprise, mentoring was on that as well. The opportunity to have paid summer internships, which I cannot say enough about. And then finally, the opportunity to have real meaningful exchanges with various people that were already in the field. So those became the pillars of our pilot program. And so um, we've been deliberately in a silent sort of pilot phase, being very, very inward, thinking about mentoring these students in very, very specific ways. Very excited that the first cohort is gone on and is going on to do very exciting things in the field. So, so this is the program that Andrea started. And when I arrived at Spelman in, in, in the fall of 2015, what I found were a group of students who were not only energized and excited about uh, the object, about the history of art, about museums, what, how museums could be transformed, I found students who were intellectually sharp. They were asking the right kind of questions, bold questions, they were not afraid to assert themselves. And what Andrea had done in a very short period of time is created this uh, community, this appetite among students, not just at Spelman, but also throughout the Atlanta University Center. The other thing about the Atlanta University Center, Spelman is one of four colleges in, in, the, in the center. It has a history. Hale Woodruff started the first uh, fine arts department at any historically black college there. As a result, he um, hosted the Atlanta Annuals every year, which was for a long time the only place where African American artists could exhibit on a regular basis. And they purchased work. So there was a great collection at Clark Atlanta University. Um, the High Museum is there. There's a wonderful archive of African American artists, the Hatch Billups collection that's now resides at Emory. So there are all these jewels around in Atlanta, at the heart of which was this program with all of these energized students. And that looked like an opportunity to us. Very much so. And when I, when I think about a few things, first, where they're going in terms of their next positions, their next decisions about graduate programs. I get very, very, very excited. But I also think through what's next. Mm -hmm. What are we going to do to continue to whet this appetite, to continue to forge meaningful partnerships with individuals that sort of, that respect where we're headed on this exciting, exciting journey. So eight months ago now, I think is when we right. heard from the yep. Walton Foundation. Do you want to share a bit about our next sure. adventures? Sure, so we put our heads together. And, and by, by the we, it was, it was not only the museum and uh, the faculty, but it was also thinking about what is the whole role of the arts at, in a liberal arts college? Um, what do we want not only the majors, but also students in general to understand about themselves and who they are and where they're going in the world? from what they, what they get from, uh, from a museum. So in fact, uh, thinking about it, we said at the core has to be a very strong academic program. So we decided to uh, propose an art history major, which we have never had, and a curatorial studies minor. We had a program, but not an academic minor. Connected to that were all these extraordinary experiences that Andrea was continually developing for our students. She calls them intensives. I, I, I love that word. Because it was not only the paid internships, it was introducing the students to uh, collectors and what it was to be a, a private collector. It was taking them to conferences, encouraging them to speak at conferences, to, to really dig deep in the archives that were available in Atlanta. And, and to this day, the High Museum is incredibly grateful for the work that our students have done uh, in the archives. 
So she was building all these incredible experiences among our students, and we decided that what we could do is we could make a bid, and the we being the Atlanta University Center, to, to become a principal incubator for the training of museum professionals of color. That we could create a pathway into first-rate graduate schools, that we could provide this, these paid internships and give experiential um, opportunities to our students, that we could introduce them to the whole weave, warp and weave of the art world, whether it was in, in from the not-for-profit side or the commercial side, and that this could be a one-of-a-kind experience for our students. Um, we were fortunate enough to be awarded the uh, gift in uh, last year, almost a year, exactly a year from now. Uh, we had to begin the process of establishing uh, accreditation for this program, and we're almost there uh, with that. And in the fall, we formally launched, but even before that, we're launching a summer program in conjunction with the High Museum, where we're, we're going to, we have uh, recruited high school students from all over the country who will come to Atlanta and spend about a month in intensive, immersive experience, understanding what the discipline of art history is, uh, what it means to be a curator, and what it means to work in a museum. So this is a very comprehensive program that's meant to encourage students starting as, as early as their high school years and cultivating their experience here at Spelman and throughout the country, and then graduating them into um, graduate schools. I'm glad that you mentioned the high school program because not only are we interested in making certain that the students think about art history as a discipline and museums as career options earlier, but we're also interested in forging relationships with families. At the end of the day, as I mentioned, my parents said, hey, if you can figure out how to convert it into a paycheck, go for it. Everyone doesn't necessarily have that type of support. And so, this is a relationship structure that is all about family. It is all about parents. It is all about making sure that their students are indeed going to have job options. We know that we can't, as I say, eat the whole elephant at the same time. The bite of the elephant that we have really, really decided to hone in on is how do we whet the appetite and make sure that they are indeed enticed to come in. And so, as I think about this very, very exciting time at Spelman, I think, bless you, I think about all of the exciting things that happen on Spelman's campus. And I was sharing with Judith and Krista, Krista earlier that I recently had to travel to LA, and when I landed, one of the most heartwarming, gratifying, rewarding photographs I got, as soon as I turned on my phone, was a photograph of two of our graduating seniors who were wearing all white, which is what we, what we wear during our Founders Day commencement, standing in front of the museum and saying thank you. So they're both on to graduate programs, they're on to doing other things, but two weeks later, their families came for Phi Beta Kappa, and so it wasn't just about celebrating them as graduates, as Spelman, you know, soon to be Spelman alumni. This was a relationship with families. This is a relationship that, you know, we can talk about the cohort structure, and we can talk about the strategy to be very, very inward and think about 12 students that we wanted to mentor, but the reality is it goes so much further than just those 12 students. And the other reality, at least for me um, thus far, has been that when they graduate, the mentoring doesn't end. I mean, we have two students that are currently working as curatorial assistants at Crystal Bridges, which is something that we're very, very excited about. But they call me all the time to talk about everything from proposals to parental support and um, parental excitement, which is a wonderful thing to be able to say when this was a field that perhaps might have seemed like a dubious and perhaps not so smart thing to, to, to go for. But I say all this to share that what we're building here is about families and it's about expanding this discipline. 
Uh, you, you you're mentioning our, our graduating seniors, and one of them actually participated with one of our faculty to write the syllabus for the high school students. Understanding what their perspective would be, she has worked with our faculty to make sure that we're using language and concepts that will pull them into their, uh, into their interest. She's, of course, going on to Harvard to uh, complete her PhD. Um, and is one of, of several, I guess, who are going on to graduate school. But the, it, one interesting thing about Augusta Savage, who was here, I think it's very important that Andrea talks about community because it's not just the individual that we are, we are educating whose, whose horizons we are, um, for whom we are opening doors to other places that she might not have, have known. It, it is a broader community. And when Augusta Savage was alive and she was in Harlem, that's exactly the function that she played. She was a magnificent sculptor, there's no question. But she had a studio, uh, the Art Garage um, in, in Harlem, and artists like Norman Lewis and Murray Bearden would drop in. She would keep track of her students, so she knew exactly when Jacob Lawrence had a birthday and was then eligible to apply for the WPA to support his, what became his migration series. So that kind of attentiveness was not in a, a college or a university, but it still existed. And it was one of the, the kinds of caring and instruction and education that made it possible for us to be doing what we do today. And when I, when I think through the things that have changed literally in the last four years, there are a couple of milestones that come to mind. So I mentioned that we launched this in 2014. And we all know that in 2015, the Mellon survey came out, which talked about 4% of people of color. I mean, this was the most cited study that has ever existed in our field. So that was really, really important. The other thing that has happened is it's very clear that across the board, this particular generation of students is very interested in contemporary practice. I mean, they don't necessarily want to be engaged in you know, what happened before. Everything is right here and right now, and that's primarily because of social media and a number of other factors which we could wax poetically over a drink. Um, so, so there are so many things that, that we have an opportunity to do. When we think about what mentoring means 360, not just part-time, just a real, real focus on, on mentoring. Um, but I love the fact that you mentioned um, Kayla Jackson. She was indeed the graduating senior that Dr. Campbell mentioned because she came to my office the other day and she said, I have another idea for the program. And of course, I'm all ears. And she said, I am teaching this course this summer, but wouldn't it be really exciting if after the student's first year, we could, then, we could then identify who was going to be the one their senior year who was going to be teaching the summer program. I say all this to say that we're getting our students very much involved in the, for future generations, involved in the actual structure of the program. I always say by no means is it a perfect program, but what's very exciting about it is the opportunity for the students to play a first-hand, meaningful role in its evolution. So it's something we're very, very proud of. And one of the things that Andrea has done exceedingly well is um, every single, with every single exhibition, she has uh, structured a conversation that's very often a big public conversation like this, but also a conversation for those students who are in the curatorial studies mode to be able to really interrogate deeply um, issues of artistic practice, of environment, un of the conditions under which artists uh, thrive. Uh, so bringing up artists like Howard Dina Pendel or Amy Sherald or uh, Deborah Roberts or any of the, what, Nicolene Thomas, just incredible incredible artists with whom our curatorial studies uh, students can have these really one-on-one -on -one intimate conversation has been, I think, a really important part of developing their consciousness. What I was sharing with Anne the other day is that as we reflect back on, again, this sort of four-year cycle of these students that are preparing to graduate, 
is that they're also in reflection mode. One student said, you know, I didn't know that I wanted to be a curator until I met one. And at first I was like, yeah. And then I said, well, wait a minute, you know, let's keep introducing them to curators. Let's keep taking them to studio visits and for behind the scenes opportunities. You just never know what's going to stick. You just, you just don't know. And so a lot of people have said in recent months, how did, how did you do it? You know, what was the blueprint for it? There were certainly things that, you know, we, we, we planned for, but in many respects, it was the things that happened more organically that were perhaps more meaningful and have a longer sustaining, perhaps, impact on the program um, writ large. Yeah, man, one of the things that's very interesting is that um, when you're at a liberal arts college, you know, your, many of your students will have many different interests. There'll be, some will be interested in cultural things, some will be interested in corporate things, some will be interested in scholarly things. And what you realize very quickly is they, they have to learn not only the content of these professions, they have to learn the culture, they have to learn the protocols, they have to learn the practices. It's if, you know, th you, you can walk into a museum and it's almost like you're walking into a secret society, right? If you don't, you know, know all of the, the, the code words. And so Andrea has been absolutely phenomenal in giving the students this sense of how things function in different arenas, uh, what questions are being asked if you're walking into an auction house, what questions are being asked by private collectors when they're building a collection, what questions are being asked when you come to a conference and people are presenting their papers. Getting the students to, to be comfortable and familiar with those settings and understanding that they have something to contribute has been absolutely key. And, and it's their poise and self-confidence and self-assurance that has been so striking. When I came to Spelman and I, I was introduced to this group of students that uh, became very, very striking. What I love about that um, story and that example is that certainly not all of the students come in with that type of poise and self-confidence. And we've had to have some very real tough conversations about soft skills. So we could talk about the coursework and we could talk about what path we want them to consider for both museum professions and for um, you know, academic, the academic route. But we had to have some really tough conversations about soft skills. And oftentimes we're talking about students that these are the first, these are the first generation to go to college in their families. And so we have to really be diligent to take every student where they are and meet all of their needs. Some were very, very comfortable in muse museum settings, grew up in Washington, D.C., and spent a lot of time at the Smithsonian and felt right at home. In other instances, there were students that had phenomenal ideas but weren't comfortable in those spaces. So we have to be able to take students wherever they are and meet them and push them to the next level with love and sometimes a swift kick, but uh, with, with, with love. And so I, I am um, very, very pleased at the diversity of voices that are coming and that are gonna show themselves and present themselves to be the next uh, museum professionals and art historians. And I would say the boldness of the voices. I think that's the other thing that we're very proud of, that, that the students who are have decided to go to choose uh, uh, either art history or uh, the curatorial profession are students with very bold voices. So understanding, um, for example, the requirement of research, of you know, delving into archives and being able to corroborate what it is that you think or feel based on evidence and uh, the evidentiary basis of, of their studies. So all, all of this together, writing is another skill that has been stressed by Andrea because in point of fact, um, we don't expect these students to, to show up at a museum and kind of blend in. By virtue of the fact that they're in the room, they're gonna change the room and they're gonna change the kinds of questions that they're gonna ask and again, change the, the way we think of things. The most 
Um, I think a powerful example of that is De Denise Murrell's recent dissertation that led to the exhibition Posing Modernity. And in fact, we're taking, Andrea is taking a few students and faculty to Paris to see the show at its version in, uh, at the Musée d'Orsay. Because here, in fact, was someone who um, is in a, a course on modern European art, and she looks at what's being shown and explained and says, I don't understand. Why aren't we talking about these other figures in these paintings? And so being able to ask those kinds of questions, which might also disrupt the narrative and may cause discomfort, is something we want our students to become comfortable with. I'm glad you mentioned boldness because none of this would have been possible if it weren't for the power of partnerships. Our partners are bold. And by that I mean those individuals who have said, we'd love it if you would send a student to us for the summer. Um, one of the things that the Mellon Foundation, again, heard our cry and our plea was about summer internships. You know, we can't say enough about our students and how essential it is for them to spend 14 weeks in DC or in New York or wherever it's going to be. A paid summer internship was critical. It was a requirement. We could go on and on to talk through who can afford and who can't afford to spend a summer, a, an unpaid summer. Um, but again, that would take us down another, another avenue. But our partners have been bold. We were very clear. We love coffee, but we're not sending our students to your institution to fetch it for the summer. We really want them to be involved in multiple projects. We want them to see you work. We want them to see multiple departments within those institutions. Some have been civic museums, some have been college and university museums, but the biggest thing is we want them to be involved firsthand to get their hands into a project that during the academic year, they simply could not. So the power of partnerships, it's not just about the family, it's not just about what happens in the classroom, but it's also about these opportunities for object-based inquiry that was going to change their, their interest in it. I, I was saying to guests the other day, we really want to make art history intoxicating. Mm -hmm. And so that's what we're, that's what we're struggling for. That's what, that's what our aims are. So speaking of partnerships, uh, a new partnership that is not uh, fully formed is one that we're studying with, uh, starting with a, a partner on the West Coast. Um, who has begun to um, make a commitment towards building an, a uh, set of archives on African-American artists. And so we've begun conversations with the Getty Center um, in, in terms of how, as they're building that, uh, in, in their research institute, as they're building that African-American archives, how that can relate to the development of our art history major and also research opportunities for our students. So what's also very interesting about the whole power of partnerships, to me, my, my strategy and the strategy that I'm so thrilled that my, my colleagues um, were supportive, supportive of and also enthusiastic about was the opportunity to be inward. You know, we were very, very uh, just focused in a very inward way. But now that all these other opportunities are happening, whether it's the Getty or other partnerships that are coming down the pike, we're finding that, wait a minute, we're expanding beyond 12 students, but we also have a very real need to pace ourselves. We can't say yes to every partnership that has come. They're all very, very fascinating, and um, some are more in-depth and more elaborate than others. But what we are preparing to unveil and what we're preparing to roll out is definitely going to make an impact on the field for generations to come. So one, one last uh, um, comment that I'd, I'd like to make has, is an inward looking comment. And that is that uh, Spelman College does a required course for every single uh, student who comes through Spelman. I thought it was interesting that at CUNY, um, American history course is an absolute requirement. Our requirement is something called African diaspora in the world. We have 2,100 black women who come to Spelman College. 
By the time they graduate, every single one of them has taken a course that has immersed them in their history and their heritage as it has contributed to the modern world globally. At the center of that is our museum and the understanding of visual culture and visual culture as a text and visual culture as a potent force uh, in the world, as a force for I ideas, for, for politics, for social formations, for all kinds of things, has been at the heart of that. So um, I, I just say that to stress that this entire program, as expansive and, and as, as it is, is very anchored and very rooted in our sense of who we are, where we come from, and where we're going. You know, I, I, I'm laughing really, really hard inside right now because when I was talking to Anne about two months ago, I have noticed a sense of buy-in and ownership from our students that I genuinely, genuinely did not anticipate. And by that I mean, I don't just mean the students that are interested in art history. We were in the space and someone was giving her, her friend or her roommate or someone a tour of, an exhi of the exhibition. And one woman said, no, the best exhibition was Halladina Tyndale. And the other one said, no, no, mm -mm, Deborah Roberts was the best exhibition. And before I knew it, I said, can you hear this? I mean, it was, it was fascinating to me because they weren't art majors. And so we were, again, trying to whet this appetite. So we know that every student is going through this ADW program, this ADW course. However, we also knew that giving them a richer sense of ownership was part of the mission and, and something that has really, really taken hold. So people beyond our expectations have started to think about not just exhibitions, but curatorial practice and the decisions and the options and the choices that curators make as a real fundamental part of their academic experience. So we, we really feel like we are, um, we are on the path and on the cusp of something very, very exciting. Yes, look what you started. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so I know that um, we were to um, stop talking so much and turning over to some questions or just to open it up for conversation, which we're, of course, more than happy to do. Or we can just keep on talking. So thank you. We, we've had, Spelman has had um, summer high school programs for quite a while now uh, with the idea that, and they're structured so that admitted students can get more deeply prepared to come in and succeed at Spelman and also to so students who may not even have chosen yet, who aren't uh, necessarily committed to Spelman, can nonetheless come and actually get college credit uh, for courses that'll give them a leg up when they do get to college, whether they choose Spelman or not. It, it has seemed to us, uh, because we knew that uh, the communities from which our students are coming may not have as much experience with the field of art history, just uh, you know, thinking about my own experience um, or curatorial studies, that in fact, it would be a good thing to try to introduce the topic sooner rather than later. So we made sure that a high school program was absolutely um, a, an essential part. Now, you're, you're, the, the question of where should it begin, I, th I think visual literacy is as important as literacy. We, we're inundated with visual text. You know, we elect presidents, we decide on what's beautiful, um, you, we, we decide on what's acceptable based on a lot of things that are represented visually. How to read text 
in a sophisticated way how to, how to construct them, how to deconstruct them. I, I think it's a conversation we ought to start with students uh, as soon as possible. And, and figuring out in a you know, K through 12 curriculum that's somebody else's <laughs> territory, I wouldn't dare think about that. But, but I do think that it's something that, that schools should begin to take up as a challenge. Um, because uh, you know, just recently, what did we just have uh, the governor from Virginia, right, who appears in his medical school, you know, in blackface and you know, standing next to the Klan. That is, that is a visual communication, and it conveys volumes. Um, and we get those kind of communications all the time, every every day, in in, in a myriad of ways. So understanding the popular visual culture and how it connects to artistic production and how it has an historical lineage and how it's connected to ideas and to, and to action, I think all of that's incredibly important. Can I also just share that, you'll have to help me with the specific numbers, but we were very, very pleased to learn that it wasn't just us talking about it, the number of people that applied for just 12 spots completely exceeded our expectations. I want to say it was 170. It's about 150. 150, see, get me up here lying. 150, <laughs> 175. 150 people applied for 12 spots. And so between guidance counselors that recommended them, parents that helped them with the applications, so we really know that we're on to something. And after this first summer, we expect to have a lot more data. So we're just uh, seeing what sticks. <laughs> and I just I can't underplay also the role here of the, muse of high, the high Museum. Because the High Museum has been an, an absolute partner in this. They have superb summer programs to begin with themselves. So partnering with them was a, a, an extra added boost for us. Here, so you should probably just stand up and. <laughs> Hi. Uh, Hi. I'm Adriana Prozer from Asia Society Museum, and I just want to thank you because that's the most inspiration co inspirational conversation I've heard in, uh, that I can think of that I've heard at, at this gathering in a long time and in general. And I, um, I think that even beyond the amazing things that you're, you're doing um, at Spelman and in your community, I, I think that you're great role models for all of us. Um, I, I spend a lot of my time, too much time worrying about the future of museums and I'm afraid of the direction that we seem to be going in. And I think what you're doing can almost serve as a role model, a road map for, for all of us to think about what we can do as curators, what we can, can encourage our directors to do as museum directors to ensure that, to ensure our survival and to um, think about the future of the field holistically and to um, find a way to create much more inclusivity within the field. So I just, uh, I don't have a question, but I wanted to thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I, I want to make a, uh, thank you so much for, for that. Um, I, when you were speaking, I don't know why, but I thought of the, the exhibit that's at the Freeze now. I think it's Dawood Bay's photographs of David Hammonds. So some of you may have seen them. And, and Dawood was at the Studio Museum during that time, David, wa David was an artist in residence um, back in the back in the seventies, early early eighties, and 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 the photographs document really capture the dynamics of these two incredible artists who were just out there. There were no, you know, that back in the day when you know there weren't structures that were housing the works of those artists, and both of them are amazing artists. I was a MacArthur Fellow, and David Hammond you know, master of the universe. <laughs> but um, but what's, what's interesting is at that time, at the Studio Museum, we had no idea, none, that K 
Kerry James Marshall or Dalawood Bay or David Hammonds or Jack Whitten or Howard Dina Fidel or any of those artists that were there were going to be who they are now. But it was a real commitment to who they are as artists. And that's what I see, wh when I came to Spelman, that's what I saw with Andrea. That she, it, it, it was, who are you? What do you have to say? What is it going to mean to the students who are going to hear what you have to say as an artist? And I just want to keep that thought alive because when all is said and done, that's one of the reasons we have museums is, that, is to be able to give a platform to those artists to have something to say. And then the other is, of course, is to make sure that it doesn't disappear. Because it can disappear. And, and, and that's, that's something, you know, African American, uh, uh, historically black colleges and universities were the first real black museums in this country. Fisk, Howard University, Hampton, Spelman, uh, Clark Atlanta, they had the collections because nobody else wanted them. If they didn't save them at that time, they wouldn't be here. So, so, so I don't think that museums are gonna go away. We have to change our form. We have to change the way we speak. We have to change the people who are in the museums. We have to disrupt maybe the status quo a little bit. But I think as long as we do that, I, I, I think we'll, there'll always be a need. If I can piggyback on what Dr. Campbell just, um, just shared, what I started thinking about was very similar. And it's simply that the leadership sets the tone. Everyone's current solution is let's create a summer internship. I can honestly say that the field of just offering summer internships has changed in the last five years because I have been working closely with students to place them at various institutions. The institutions that once did not have summer internships now do. So on one hand, I'm very excited because there's a shift, right? There's a real commitment. However, when the leadership is setting the tone, it cannot end with summer internships. We've got to think about hiring practices. We have to think about everything from institutional bias. If we're going to really make a long-term sustaining shift and change, it cannot simply rest on the backs of summer internships. So I really, really am going to keep beating this drum to anyone that will listen. We have got to make sure that these internships do indeed transform and transfer into paid positions that are about a living wage, that are about really, really respecting and changing the field. So thank you for your, your comment, but the leadership definitely sets the tone, and the leadership sets the tone. <laughs> okay. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. hear the voice, I want to see the voice. Okay. Uh, hi, <laughs> Laura Buchel, the Hudson River Museum in Yonkers. Um, first of all, thank you very much. And two things, um, we have for 20 plus years had a junior docent program at our museum. Uh, we have 90 students uh, all four years. So is our students like that, students that could apply to your program for the summer program? Definitely. Okay, so we'll, we'll get in touch with you about that. <laughs> uh, the other thing I wanted to know is how do museums get involved with your internship program? So again, when I think about how this all evolved, I am at an AAMD meeting, and I remember the Harm Museum in Florida was the first conversation I had, and it was, would you take one of our students for the summer? <laughs> and it was, we'll figure it out. <laughs> you know, it was between sessions, and it was, awesome. It was one of those things that it, it was the very first summer and it started, it caught like wildfire. And so to be perfectly honest with you, with those 12 students, I'm now fielding more requests than I have students to fill. So I'm taking names, if you will, and I am eager to work with institutions whereby there's a supervisor that says, I want to work with this well, a student on this particular project so that they come in with a very real um, plan and a commitment to it because it's, it's not easy. It's, it's time consuming. We all know how time consuming, but we're taking names. 
I will tell you something else that Andrea will do. You know, students, sometimes students won't go to her, right? And they'll come to me and say, oh, I'd like to be a, a, an internship at XYZ Museum. And I go right to Andrea and I said, what, what's up with this student? And she will say, she's not ready. This is not the right time for her. She needs, to, she needs a few other things before she goes out. So she's all on both sides. So she's very demanding of the museums, but she's also very demanding of the students. Um, so that when we do send a student, um, then the expectations are very high because we feel you've got a superb student coming to you who can really do something and accomplish something at the museum uh, with the right kind of project. So this red number counting down, saying that I've got 45 seconds left to wrap this up is scaring me. <laughs> One more, maybe? Okay. Hi. 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 Up here. Hi, up oh. here. Oh, I'm going to duke it out. Oh, wait, sorry. Should we ask both questions? OK. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> One, two. All right, um, my name is Anita Bateman. I'm a curatorial fellow at the RISD Museum. And just uh, thank you. Oh, thank you both so much for your uh, keynote. Uh, so in the field, there's this new drive for diversity and, and inclusion. And I was wondering if you both could give some thoughts about uh, how to change cultures of institutions so that they're more amenable to younger voices and POC voices. Because in that sort of drive for diversity and inclusion, the infrastructure may not be there to sort of uh, support those younger and newer voices that uh, the institution is looking for. So if you can offer anything about changing that culture, that would be great. Right, so, so um, I, I, I spent 23 years at New York University. It's not a museum, it's a university. But, but when I arrived at um, the school where I was dean, 89% uh, of the students were white and 98% of the faculty was white. So a pretty homogeneous place. And so the question is, how do you walk into, in general, how do you walk into any place and begin to change the culture when the culture around you is so hom monolithically homogeneous? That's really the question. And, and colleges and universities have to make a deliberate effort. And so again, uh, to, to echo Andrea, it starts from the top. You coming in have every right to sit down with whoever is the leadership and say, okay, I'm here. What are, how are we going to begin the process of bringing other voices in and having those other voices make a meaningful contribution? It has to be deliberate. You cannot, we cannot ask people to show up one day and say, okay, we're done, because it doesn't work. As you said, the culture has to shift. The person at the top has to begin to make some deliberate issues. What, is our, what, what exhibitions are we showing? What artists are we showing? What interpretive programs are we having? Who's on our board of trustees? Who's on the, who's on the senior sta staff? All those have to be questions that have to be asked at the same time, and it takes a long time, it takes five years, 10 years, to wake up one morning and say, oh, you know what, now 35% of our faculty are faculty of color. Um, or, you know, 40% of our student body are students of color. It, it takes time, but you have to, do, you have to be deliberate about it. It's, you can't just kind of let it happen. I also, to, to piggyback and to echo some of those things, I often wonder what would happen if we recommended to some of the senior teams and some of the museum directors that they would also benefit from some refresher courses and they would benefit from some intensives and they would benefit because if not, we're going to always simply be offering summer internships. So there has to be a shift at the top that really does you know, say, we need a new mindset. You know, we, we, need a, we need a new mindset in the boardroom. We need a new mindset at, at the directorial level. We, we, we have to start making real, real bold, powerful shifts and changes if we're interested in moving on and not just remaining ivory towers. So and, and you also need, 
Thank you. You also need new knowledge um, because you, you have to, and the reason I decided to write a biography of Ron Lee Bearden is that you can read an essay here and an essay there and a catalog essay there and a catalog essay there. You, you re need real opportunities to write different narratives and get those narratives into circulation and to get them published and to get them out and to get them talked about because that's all part also of changing the culture. Hi, I'm Gabrielle Tillenberg from Strathmore, Montgomery County, Maryland. And my question is, what approach does the program take to some perhaps more traditional program requirements, particularly language requirements in the art history field that may act as a gatekeeper for certain students? So, we're really lucky at Spelman College because my predecessor, Dr. Beverly Daniel Tatum, made as a goal um, that 100% of our students should study abroad before they leave. Now, we didn't, we're not quite at 100%, but last year, 75% of our graduating class had studied abroad. That means we have an incredibly robust modern languages program. And so actually, I have to say, that was actually one of the least of our worries because so many of our students are, uh, if not bilingual, multilingual, and languages are alive and well. I can genuinely say that we have not, in, in our program thus far, I can genuinely say that we have not talked about that. It's a very entrepreneurial mindset, if you will. We have not gotten to that point. I think it's very important. I think that it's something that we need to keep on our radar, but in all honesty, we have not talked about forming new institutions from the ground up. We've often talked about strategies and structures that are going to aid our students in um, the process of going into existing institutions, but I'll have to give that some additional thought. Yeah. So, so one thing we have, we have thought about is establishing a different relationship with our community. And so we're, we're planning a new academic facility at Spelman, and that academic facility will include uh, some expanded space for the museum, a new uh, gallery. And one of the things that we're doing, if you haven't been to Spelman, it's surrounded by a wall. It looks like a convent. I mean, it really is surrounded by this impenetrable wall. And this new building will be the first time that we're going to extend what we call a front porch to our community that will allow you to literally come in off the street, walk into the lobby, and walk right into the museum, or at least the, that part of the museum that is there. So we can't build a whole new institution, but we can recalibrate our relationship to their, our surrounding community. Yeah, I think we have two minutes. Something you set up here is something that uh, my field, I specialize in American Indian art, uh, we deal with a lot um, that is worrying, and that is that you mentioned how all your students are coming in really invigorated about the present and about what's happening now, and you know which they should, which is wonderful. However, you know our collection of American Indian art, we have about 18,000 works of art. Maybe if I'm being generous, maybe 700 of those are what anyone would call modern or contemporary art. The rest are historic arts. So without putting the burden on you, I should put, we'll put, put the burden on us. What can we as curators, we as museums do to invigorate an interest in historical arts? Because that's, I think, a challenge that many of us do also have. Uh, so so I, 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 there's no question that our students come in with the here and now. And I think that's one of the challenges we have as educators to put the here and now in conversation with the past and to understand the way the, 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 way the past cascades up uh, to the present. And, and the, 
African diaspora in the world is one of those ways in which we immediately introduce students to an historical perspective of who they are and where they come from. And uh, by making, uh, we are, we, as I said, we're graduating art history from a minor to a major, and much of that has to do with giving them uh, an historical perspective on um, origins and influences and sources that can come from the most unlikely places in, in order to uh, impact the work of the, of the present. Um, and I think that can be exciting. Um, I, I, I think that's part of the challenge and it's part of the excitement. And I think that the, the onus is on us. I'm glad you said we, because the onus is definitely on, on all of us. Without sharing too much information, I just heard of a wonderful project that is in its incubation stage now about the Byzantine era and how African American artists are um, really looking at this era as a, as a as fertile ground. We have to find out how to make it sexy, as my students told me. How do you make it sexy? And so with bringing all of the academic rigor and all of the expectation, the onus is on us because they come in with a very, very contemporary mindset. They want to make sure that um, it's relevant. We, it's on us to make it relevant. I think we're probably out of time. 